Where does it go? Like, wait, so when you took your class, you had a contact in your eye. It just wasn't somewhere you said. I don't know. I One minute passed. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so, welcome to lecture 16. Today we are going to talk about control and we're going to talk about Bluetooth and we're going to get back to iOS. Yeah, everybody else is like, yes. Um, so essentially, um, this may be, we may get through Bluetooth today. If we do, then next time we'll start talking about Python. Um, and how to set up some other things. We're basically going to use Python for um, a lot of different things, um, including like a web server for interfacing with a database and for machine learning. Um, but we will talk about a lot of that next time and not in one lecture. We'll probably take three lectures to get through a lot of that. Um, okay, so um, here's a shameless kind of pro. Um, so uh, next semester I'm offering a course called Ubiquitous Computing or UbiComp. Um, if you like some of the things that we've been doing in here, uh, go take a look or you can talk to me about what this course might entail. It's another 5-7 thousand level course. Um, I've offered this before in the past, one time the first semester I was here. Um, and essentially we're going to talk about what it means to be in the age of ubiquitous computing, which is essentially things, it's called pervasive computing, the Internet of Things um, is part of UbiComp. We're going to talk about HCI design for how do you how do you design things for uh, the UbiComp era. Um, we're going to talk about some really seminal papers in ubiquitous computing, and we'll do some advanced prototyping, which includes some of the things we've done in this class. We'll do a little bit of like machine learning, some OpenCV. Um, we won't necessarily do it from a mobile phone. We'll also use the 3D printer, um, and there'll be a final project. There's no tests or anything that are associated with it, but. It is, it's a class that's a fair workload because of the amount of uh, papers that we read and kind of discuss. But it's essentially a very much an upper division graduate level course. Um, but it's also good preparation for if you want to know how to design things for the uh, different kind of mobile computing era as we go into the Internet of Things era. Okay. There's my spiel. I did want to mention it. If you got questions on it, let me know. I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Course logistics. Um, A5 is going to be due next week. Um, so it's up. So essentially A4 was due, I don't know, a few minutes ago. And A5 is going to be due Friday of next week. right? So not this Friday, but a week from Friday. Um, and we'll talk about what's involved with A5. It is now time because A, there's A5, and then there's A6, and then there's the final project, and we're done. Okay, so it is time to start nailing down a final project that your team wants to do. So really start thinking about it. Start thinking about what you want it to do and some of the different um, essentially milestones that you want it to hit. Um, because your final project proposal is going to be due at the same time as A6. Okay, so that proposal, it's like a paragraph telling me what it is you're going to do. But then it's a set of different four different objectives that you are going to meet with your application. And we'll talk more as that deadline gets a little bit closer on what exactly I want for that. Um, talk with your group about the mother of all demos and whether or not you want to opt into that or not. So we had talked about the mother of all demos probably the first day of class and never since. Um, and we'll talk about it as it gets closer. Okay. And the rest of that's for A6. We'll come back to it. Okay. The agenda for today, we're going to talk, we're going to finish off talking about microcontrollers. I'm um, going to talk about a uh, very, very brief kind of talk on motor control through a microcontroller. And then we're going to talk about the different shields 
that you can attach to a microcontroller. Um, I'm going to go over from there Bluetooth communication. So we're going to talk about how you use an Arduino to do some things with Bluetooth. I'm going to talk about how you use iOS to do some different things with Bluetooth. And we're going to talk about the protocol for Bluetooth low energy. Um, good. Okay, so here are the specs for assignment 5. Now that A4 is turned in, and ready to go, and everybody's really happy with it. Okay, so I want you to create an iOS application that uses a Bluetooth template that, you know, I'm giving you that we write in class. And I want it to read and display sensor data from two or more sensors that are attached to the Arduino. Okay, one of those sensors needs to have an analog input, so you're going to use the analog read function on Arduino. Uh, the other sensor could be another analog read, could be a digital, could be binary, you know, ones and zeros output. Um, and essentially, I want you to take those and communicate them back to the phone in iOS. Okay? Um, so in some way, I want you to display that sensor data, and it should be more than just a text label of what that sensor data is. Okay? What is more than a text label? Whatever you want it to be. Just don't put a text label with the value that's updating right there. Right? Do something with it. Right? Graph it. That'd be awesome. Right? Or figure out something, you know, do some, put some logic behind what that value is. And then it, it can be a text label that you're updating and telling me something about it. Okay? As long as it's not just a raw sensor value that you're updating a text label with. Um, then I want you to be able to send two or more control signals to the microcontroller that change the behavior of what the microcontroller is doing in some way, shape, or form. Okay? Very, very easy. I want you to update something that is noticeable to the Arduino. Uh, the Arduino uh, needs to make use of interrupts. I want you to have at least one interrupt, an external interrupt. I want you to use the digital outputs that are on it, so light up at least one LED. Okay? I want you to use pulse width modulation. And I want you to use the ADC, which is pretty much wrapped up in some of the other things that are up there. Right, so that pulse width modulation, I don't know, if you wanted to use it to control a servo, you could use it to control a servo. If you wanted to use it to control the brightness of an LED, that's fine too, as long as you're using it and I can see the output. Okay, fair enough. Okay, um, uh, something that we're, uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, so this will make sense later. Um, you are not allowed to use the Fermata on the Arduino. And if you don't know what that is, then you're in good shape. If you do know what that is, don't use it. Okay? But we'll talk about what it is too later on. Okay, so continuous servos. This is where we um, stopped last time talking about some things. Okay, I'm going to grab a pin here. Okay, so the way that a continuous servo works um, each pulse is a new command. So every time, so we're going to generate a pulse on the microcontroller. I'm going to send it off to this continuous servo. Um, and for every single pulse that it gets, it's going to change the rotation in some way. Right? Now this is different than a rotational servo. Why is this different? What's a rotational servo? Reach back. Right, so the rotational servo, I've got some pulse width modulation, and I have a repeating pulse that I keep sending it, which is essentially telling it, okay, be at 15 degrees, right? And it's going to go 15 degrees and stay there. As long as I keep sending that 15 degrees pulse, it's like, I'm staying right here, right? This continuous servo is something that keeps going on around. So for every single pulse that I give it, that might tell it, hey, move 15 degrees. So one pulse moves 15 degrees. I give it another pulse, and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to move another 15 degrees, Okay. So if these are the pulses that I'm sending it right here, um, the pulse that tells it to stay in one position, to do not move, neutral, you didn't have to, you basically, if you wanted to stay in, in position, you don't have to send this pulse at all, right? But if you send a pulse that's one and a half milliseconds long, that means stay put, okay? If you send a pulse that's one millisecond long, so as you go this way, we're going to start moving in the clockwise direction, and the further away we are, from one and a half milliseconds, the further I want the servo to move. So if I'm down here at one millisecond, that's going to say 
move clockwise 165 degrees. A real, it's, it's going to move this thing around like that. If I send it a pulse that's in between 1 and 1 1.5, that's going to be move clockwise 80 degrees. So don't move quite as much. And the closer I get to 1.5 milliseconds, the smaller the movements I want it to do are in a clockwise direction. In the same way, going counterclockwise, 80 degrees would be right here. Or if I get all the way up to, say, 2 millisecond pulse that I give it, then that's move counterclockwise 165 degrees. All right, continuous servo demo. Let's do this. Arduino. Stop. That's an analog servo example. You know what? Let's just create a new one. Here's what we'll do. Okay, we need to set up in a loop. Okay, so here's what I did. I'm creating a new Arduino project right here. Voila. I've got my setup. I've got my loop function right here. Um, what I will do is I'll set pin 9 as the output. Right? So... Here is pin 9. Oh, come on. Pin 9. You can see it. It's marked. Wow. Wonderful. Pin 9. Okay. We'll show you. I'll show you as I'm making connections for that. Okay. So essentially, what I'm going to do here is let's create something. Let's create. Um, I'll create a. Let's say. We want to create a pulse on pin nine, right? So I'm going to say digital right. Now I can't set, I can't use all of the different um, pulse width modulation things that are made for that because they're built for rotational servos. When I'm repeating something, with these continuous servos, I just want to send it a pulse, <laughs> and I want to do it one time because it's going to move the whole direction, right? So I, I don't want to set do anything with the pulse width modulation that's built in for me. So I'm going to say digital right, pin nine, high. Then let's delay microsec if I can spell. Delay microseconds. How many microseconds should I delay this? So at 1.5 milliseconds, that's 1500 microseconds, um, it stays put. How much do we want to move this thing? 1750. 1750. Um, I'd have to look at the data sheet for this servo, okay. but I'm pretty sure that it's probably close to. It's probably like 100 degrees or something like that. Okay. All right, so then we'll set the pin low. Everybody see what I'm doing here? Right? Now I'm going to do a delay. Come on. So I'm going to delay this microcontroller enough to let it move. Right? So let's, what, delay for five seconds? Right? Five, one, two, three. So 5,000 milliseconds, all right? Milli is 1,000th. Micro is... One millionth. Now we're talking. Okay. So, no, I don't really want to save this. Okay. Let me verify. Hey, it's done verifying. This is a sketch. Let me make sure that I'm connected to the right one. Board, Uno, serial port, bam, I'm on the right one. So I'm going to upload this to the Arduino, and it's going to keep doing this right here. Okay. So let's go over here. Let's get a live video of something that's going on. Here's my board. Here is my servo right here. I've got three inputs on it. The red one, can you guys guess what that one is? Voltage. What's the black one? Awesome. Moving on. So I'm going to connect the black one here to ground. Boom. I'm going to connect the positive to voltage. So now I've got power and ground hooked up. Bam, I'm hooked up to 5 volts. Let me grab another pin. Which pin am I going to connect it to? 9. Now we're rocking. Oh, this is good. We're just rocking and rolling here. 
Okay, so there's a yellow line on this servo. Well, I'm going to take that and connect it to pin 9, bam, right here. So now I'm waiting for five seconds. Four, five, oh, oh my goodness, it's moving. Not 100 degrees. <laughs> so I was off on that. Wow, every five seconds it's going to do something. Oh, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Should we do something else with it? What should we do? Run it for 2,000. So it would go, it would go, here, how about we do this? How about I set it to 1550? And then I set that to be one second. Don't save. And now I'm going to upload. What is this? Uh huh. What's it doing? It's turning. <laughs> it's turning. It is turning. Huh? Oh. It's like a really awful clock. With this, here's my second hand. That's it. We're done with servos. Okay. If you want to use them, you know how to use them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. I'm gonna leave that running. But I'll let you see me. Here. Okay. There was a continuous servo demo. All right, DC motor control. If you want to control a motor, um, the way that you do it is also through pulse width modulation. So essentially, if you've got a motor, um, the if you give it longer bur bursts from pulse width modulation, that means you're giving it power for a longer amount of time. Okay, and that means that when you've got a motor that's spinning like this, if you're just really cycling the power to it really quickly, that controls the speed at which your motor is running. All right? Same thing as pulse width modulation. A servo has a little feedback loop. You're doing position. With motor, you hook, if you hook it up to power straight to a battery, any motor, it's going to spin as fast as it can. Okay? If I modulate the power that I give to it, it's going to spin slower. If I just, just give it a little bit of power every single time, that's going to basically go really slowly. Every single RC car essentially works like that that you've ever had in your life or seen. Question. Yes, this is a DC brush motor. Um, if you want to use a stepper motor, it's very different. Yeah, but there are packages if you want to use a stepper motor. Um, so it's just like LED brightness. It's just like the dimmer switch in your home. Okay. If anybody has a dimmer switch, the way that it works is it controls the amount of power that it's giving to a light bulb. Right? Okay. How many of you have a CFL that's inside of a dimmer switch? Complex fluorescent light bulb. light bulb. Light bulb. No? Don't connect it to a dimmer switch. It'll blow up. Okay? They make dimmable ones. Most of them are not dimmable. All right? Don't connect that to a dimmer switch. Okay. So, motors use a lot of power. The Arduino board is not going to cut it for controlling motor. Okay? Um, it just provides the control signal that you're going to give to the motor. Okay, so is this bad or good? This right here, this is a motor, and this is the two different leads, and I've got them connected to six and five on the Arduino. That's bad. Why is that bad? That's right. All of the current that's coming out of one of these pins, it's saying, hey, hey, Arduino pin, give me as much current as you possibly have inside that you're essentially regulated to, and I'm going to run the motor with that, right? And all of this, all of the, all, it's going to, all of that current needs to go back inside the microcontroller to ground, right? Um, if you do this, it'll probably work fine. 
for a day, for a week, maybe a month. And then, but eventually, you're putting so much pressure on these pins, this Arduino is going to go bye-bye. Okay? It's just going to stop working erratically, and you're going to wonder why. So that can damage the GPIO that's on your microcontroller. Don't do that. Instead, you want to hook up your control signal to something that's controlling how much power you give it. Right? Does anybody know what you would do? Do you know what you would do? Yeah. You could use one of these, a high power MOSFET. Well, high power FET. You could also use like a BJT. You're talking about PMP. You can also use one of those. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but you can get the same kind of control, the same kind of levels with this. Um, essentially, you've got your control signal, which is on pin 3, and it goes over here to your little G thing. Okay? That's the gate. You don't have to know that. But essentially what happens here is here's your motor, and your motor is connected up to D, and S right here is connected to ground. Okay? So the motor has positive 60 volts in, and if D and S are ever connected to one another, power is going to go through the motor. If they're not connected to one another, there's no power going through the motor. Okay? Essentially, this is an electronic switch. If you give it a 1, sorry, it's a high power effect. If G equals 0, disconnect D and S. If G equals 1, connect D and S together. Okay? Connect the power to the motor. And that will essentially control it. There's the Arduino control signal. It's on pin 3. Okay. So, here's a medium speed. Here's a slow speed. Here's a fast speed. Okay? Everybody okay with that? We're good? If you want to create a quadcopter and you want to use motors, the speed, all you're doing is connecting this up to a motor. Let's say you've got a helicopter, right? And you want to control how fast it goes up. If you want it to go up slowly, then you'll want to use a pulse width modulation that's a medium speed. If you want to shoot it off the ground like a rocket, then just use pulse width modulation that is essentially, it's, like, it's almost a full pulse, and you'll just fly this thing up as fast as it can. Okay? Fair enough? Good? All right. Um, so there's lots of other sensors that you can use that you maybe want to use with A5. Um, Broadly, those are into three different categories, analog, digital, and binary sensors. So binary sensors are things like read switches, things like buttons, and things like ball switches. So essentially, have you guys ever seen this little white sensor sitting on the top of a doorway before? Yeah? All that is is it's something called a read switch, and the other side is a magnet. Okay? So essentially, a read switch looks like this little diagram here. It's got a little, so it's got wire that comes out on each side, and then it's got this little magnetically controlled arm. And when you put a magnet close to it, it goes, and it makes a connection in the read switch. When you pull the magnet away, it's loose. And that's how you know if a door is open or closed, when you see these connected to a door. Okay? So the output of that sensor is zero or one, right? Digital logic low or digital logic high. Um, a button works the same way as we saw last time with the little pull-up. We had a pull-up resistor that was connected to it. Um, and a ball switch is kind of a neat little thing. It's essentially a can, and it has a wire that comes off of that can, and there's a ball inside, a metal ball, right? And if you, if you take the sensor and you tilt it this way, that ball slides back down over here. And if you tilt it this way, the ball will slide back, and it will make a connection between the outside of the can and the wire. Right, so that now current can flow through it. Okay, and that is this little type of thing right there. So this is how they used to do um, tilt switches. Right, so if you ever tilted something one way, the, the can would fall down and it would know that it was in one position. It's for when you only want to know I am angled and not angled. Right, an accelerometer is what you want to use for how what is that angle. Right, but these right here, super, super cheap. Okay, pennies. Pennies. Okay. They're also really good for detecting vibration. Why? Yeah, so if it's just sitting in this position and I flick 
I flick it, that ball is going to go connect, no connect, connect, no connect. It's going to it's going to go crazy on my microcontroller, right? All right. So that would be a shake sensor, a little vibration sensor. Uh, Intel implemented that when they made a shake sensor in 2006. One of the first shake sensors. They used this. The four accelerometers were really popular. Okay. Analog sensors. Um, the dual to a read switch that's an analog sensor is a Hall effect sensor. It's essentially, it tells you the amount of the magnetic flux that's in the air, okay? The strength of a magnet, okay? But it's an analog value, so you know whether the magnet's very, very close or very, very far away, okay? You can have a capacitive touch sensor, right? So when you're actually connecting or not connecting, yeah? And accelerometers are analog. You can get analog accelerometers, Right? All I mean by that is the output is some voltage between 0 and whatever the power is. 0 and 3.3 .3 volts. Right? And you have to read the output and interpret it, what that means. Okay? Fair enough? Good. Moving on. Okay. Um, if you want to do uh, a lot of... I'm not going to go... This is the only slide that I'm really going to talk about this. Um, if you... You can go onto the playground.arduino and looking at interfacing with hardware and kind of look at all of the different sensors that exist out there. Okay? Right? Or at least ones that people have written a lot of things. So thermistors, light sensors, all of that stuff. Whatever you want to use, use it. Okay? You need two sensors. Digital sensors. Okay, so these are slightly different than the binary sensors that I talked about before. There's some logic. Essentially, you've got a sensor. It's hooked up to your Arduino, and you're going to send a command to it. Right? This is, hey, give me your value. Right? So let's say you have a... Um, a digital output thermometer, right? Essentially, what you're going to do is say, hey, give me the temperature. It's going to spit back a value, right? It's either going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be uh, some bit bang value, right? It might be a float value that it sends over the serial port, or it might be ASCII text, right? It might be some opcode and then the digital value. Is this okay? All right. Right, so you can get a digital thermometer. I think this right here is a barometric pressure sensor, right, where it can also measure um, the temperature, right? So you would send, hey, I want the temperature, and it would send you back the temperature, or give me the barometric pressure, and it would tell you the barometric pressure. The fun thing about that is you can tell where you are inside of a building, because barometric pressure is very, very consistent with your elevation above sea level, right? So you can get elevation without having to do a GPS, okay? And actually, GPS sensors, a lot of them will use barometric pressure to kind of pinpoint that value just a little bit better on what your altitude is. Okay? Not a lot. Garmin probably does that. I don't know if anybody else does. Okay? Okay. Um, also very, very related, um, there are these things called Arduino shields, right? So um, there's a lot of people that, that manufacture shields for the Arduino, and they're essentially, um, it's just a lot of different things that you can do that are in the same kind of form factor, right? So this is a shield. Right? And you can essentially take this and plug it into the Arduino. Right? It's made perfectly the form factor for it so that it gets its power from the board um, and it can do anything in parallel that you need it to do. So this is an example shield that you plug into the board where it's got an LCD screen on the top of it. Right? And you can actually display stuff out onto the LCD. Okay? Um, also on the bottom of it is this little lithium backpack, right? which connects to the bottom of the Arduino and provides power to it. Okay, a little lithium ion backpack. Um, oh, did I miss this one? Here's, here's another one, which connects to an SD card and it reads any MP3s off of it and it will play it out onto this right here. So cheap little headphones recorder, right? A Walkman, if you will. <clears throat> Sorry, it's funny to me. Yeah, you guys were alive for Walkmans, right? Yeah. Some people are saying no. Okay, that's fine. It's no big deal. You've never seen the 80s. That's okay. It's fine. Yeah, I have so many Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Okay, good. Like, dude, did you have... Wait, wait, wait. When I say a Walkman, it's a video. Cause it's, a, it's a video. It's a tape. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Oh, I didn't know that they had done... I knew that they, like, a Discman may have done some stuff. Fair enough. Okay, fine. Good. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the Walkman. Exactly, the Walkman. Um, here's something called a video game shield. Essentially, you plug it into the top of uh, here, and it has audio left, right, and a component video out, so you can connect it up to something. Um, there are also some connectors on here, so you can put together a controller 
really, really quickly from the Arduino, right? And the Arduino controls all of the video output, right? So you can make your own little um, Arduino video game, right? You, you can make Pong, you can make Tetris, okay? You're not going to make anything with any kind of graphics in it because there is no graphics card, all right? Um, this is a Bluetooth shield, right? Does this look familiar? It does. Why does this look familiar? Because it's in the cabinet drawers. Yes, it's been there the whole time, right? Actually, it's inside of this little metal-looking, like, saran wrappy plastic bag. What is that bag? A static shield. Why would I need a static shield? Because electrostatic discharge is really, really bad. Electrostatic discharge, or ESD, what is ESD? Oh, this is circular. I don't like it. What? What is it? Yes, both. Yes, that one, way more common. That one, uh, it happens. It happens. It, yes, right? It's why you enter when you enter their clean room, you've got to be suited up and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, so essentially, if you've ever worked in, you know, if you're writing software somewhere and they take, hey, we'll take a tour down to the factory, you get inside of a, like a white suit that they put you in because they don't want you to break any of the components by walking next to them, okay? ESD. Has anybody ever changed out the RAM inside of your computer? Yes. All right. Did you have to do anything special? Touch the case and discharge yourself before you touch the motherboard. Because if you touch the motherboard and it goes shock like that, you might as well not turn the computer on. Why? Because you've burnt components on the motherboard. Eh, it might still work. Okay? Why am I telling you this? Don't blow up the $30 Bluetooth shield, okay? This is your body. I want you to think of your hand as having that voltage on it all of the time because you're walking around, you're, you know, you're walking around, you're doing your lab work, it's all fun and games and it's good, it's super late at night. All of a sudden it's cold outside and there's a lot of voltage on everybody's body and they're walking around, they go to get their Bluetooth shield and without thinking about it, I'm just like, oh, you know, I grab it and it goes, like the, in my hand, and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody. It probably still works, but I'm not going to tell my team that that just happened, right? Right? So when you touch it, and you have a lot of voltage on your body, this is what happens. Don't do that, because it'll blow the board. And it'll blow the board in really weird ways, right? Like, it might work for a day, or a week, or a month, and then it'll start failing in weird ways, and you're like, what the hell happened? Okay? This is still working, by the way. All right, so I'm, I'm going to disconnect that. It's getting on my nerves, but you guys can't hear it. Um, so here's a quick video. That's the Arduino. So there's the Bluetooth shield. It's in red. It's just plugged into the top. There's a potentiometer, a rotational servo, a button, and some LEDs. Bam. We're going to connect that up. This is from Red Bear. I didn't make this, by the way. Ah, there's my iOS app. I'm going to go to settings, Bluetooth. Oh, this is a great video. This is good. OK, I'm going to go to connect. Oh, it's connecting. It's, ah, it's an Uno board, the Arduino Uno. And now I have full control over the Arduino. Here's an output, high, low, high, low. I'm narrating this for you, but it's okay, it's fine. Okay, output, I'm gonna set this up. Ah, this is an input pin now, right? So you just set up that input pin. So now when he hits the button, bam. It's magic, it's crazy iPhone doesn't have any cords connected to it. Okay, this one we're going to connect as a, a pulse with modulation. Perfect. Here we go. Bright. Very bright. 
not so bright. Did you like plan out this? No, this is totally <laughs> off the cuff, by the way. All right, now, servo. They just set up a servo, and you can look at, the source code for this is completely available, by the way. So you can look at all of this. But essentially, that servo, you could just kind of control what the servo value is, the analog pulse width modulation. Okay? Oh, and the potentiometer. I forgot about the potentiometer. Here we go. You see that value going up? You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> but you can use that value. There's a potentiometer. If you use a potentiometer, I would count that as your analog sensor. Okay, that's fine. All right, because you still have to read in off of the ADC and display it back to me in some way, shape, or form. Okay, good. Happiness? All right. So, this is the Bluetooth low energy shield. All right, this is not a Bluetooth shield. This is a Bluetooth low energy shield, and by the end of this lecture, you will know what the difference between those two are. Okay, this is BLE made really, really easy. Okay, this is why I got the Arduinos and the shield, because it makes this very, very easy to do. Um, it's going to take care of all of the protocol for Bluetooth low energy, okay? You don't like that, but that's okay, right? Um, essentially, what it does, in order to do that, it needs to take up a lot of the pins that are on the Arduino. So it takes up pins 8 through 13 of the Arduino, um, and most of that is related to the uh, serial peripheral interface, the SPI, okay? So SPI is a way of talking over a few pins, to different things, right? So essentially you have a firmware, sorry, you have some hardware that's on the Arduino called SPI, um, and it has a slave select, a master out, slave in, a master in, slave out, and a clock, okay? The clock is so that they're both on the same frequency, they can read from each other. Master out, slave in, and master in, slave out, so that you can have dual communication at the exact same time. Right? And slave select, what is that? Bam. It's essentially an opcode that tells you which selector you're going to do. Right? So you can have a bunch of different things connected onto this master out, slave in, and master in, slave out. Kind of fanned out. Why is that? Why would that be important for an Arduino shield? Right, so I could daisy chain a bunch of shields on top for the Arduino, right? That's just an example. You can see why it's useful, because I can put different things and I can have them all selected, okay? Um, pins 8 and 9 are essentially for, these are specific to this shield, right? You actually, when you want it to read, you have to take one of those pins low. You won't have to do it, but it does it, okay? It has to take one of those pins low, and it, when it wants to communicate back, it's going to take one of those pins high. Okay, it's essentially a little fail-safe in there, and it's part of their firmware. We have to deal with it, okay? So it's going to take up pins 8 and 9. So the remaining pins that you have are pins 0 through 7 and pins A0 through A5, so your ADCs. You've still got all the ADCs left, okay? Good? Happiness? All right. How are we doing on time? I got my clock today. 408. Awesome. All the, all the communication, everything that we need to do is going to be set up inside of this function, or inside of this library, ble underscore shield dot h. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Here's the Bluetooth ener low energy shield. To initialize the Bluetooth low energy shield, we're going to use the function ble underscore begin. That is going to set up all of the spy um, inside of your Arduino, all of those peripherals that needs to be set up. It's also going to send out and send some initial communication between the shield and the Arduino, right, so that it sets up the shield properly. Okay? Then there are these other two functions, Bluetooth low energy underscore available. Right? So if data is available from the Bluetooth low energy shield is what that function says. So while that is true, I'm going to read the byte using ble underscore read. I'm going to read from the port, okay? And it's gonna return a value, and then I'm gonna serial.write it. What is that doing? What is this doing? What is this code doing right here? Yes, so it takes it from the Bluetooth low energy, the shield, writes it to the serial port, okay? The serial right here is the USB port. That's not the spy. Good, happiness? 
What's the difference between serial and spy? Or four? Usually four. You can do it with three. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, if we want to, if we don't want to read, but we actually want to write to the shield, um, here's some code. This is this is an example from Red Bear. Um, essentially, while there is data available on the serial port, read that data from the serial port. Okay. Buffer it up in some way. Right here, that's what all of this code does. So pack it up into 16 bytes and add it to the transmit buffer, right? So I've got this little buff at I that I'm essentially reading from the serial port and saving those bytes into this buffer. Once I get 16 of them, or once I get an end line, I'm going to call this ble underscore write function. I'm going to put all of that into the write buffer, okay? That does not transmit it over Bluetooth. This transmits it over Bluetooth. This BLE underscore do events. What a wonderful naming convention. Okay, if you guys write code like this and put it out on the internets, I'm going to be disappointed. All right, this should be a way better name. What would be a good do events? Transmit events? Something like that? <laughs> right? Something, I mean, some, I mean, there's a lot going on inside that function. Like, I, 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 I understand why they said do events, but you could do something right there related to the protocol. Anyway, there's pet peeving right now. All right, Bluetooth low energy Fermata. Um, you can go on to uh, the uh, Red Bear's little BLE Shield website and you can download this Fermata thing. And essentially what that does, does anybody know what the Fermata is? It's a pro. oh, that's funny. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, it is. It's it's a protocol that you adopt, right? So essentially what you would do is like, hey, Bluetooth low energy, here's the Fermata. I'm going to put it on the Arduino. And that Fermata allows you to, from now over Bluetooth, to configure the entire microcontroller. Okay? So except for setting up certain, um, like, interrupts and things. But it allows you to turn all of the um, digital GPIO into inputs or outputs and set the value of what they should be over Bluetooth. It allows you to set up the analog inputs and the sampling rate, right? And how often that's going to transmit back, right? It's essentially you just upload it onto the Arduino, you call it good, and then from your iOS app is where you're setting it all up, okay? I'm not allowing you to do that, all right? The reason that I'm not allowing you to do that is not because it makes it too easy, because I'm all for making it easy when it's rapid prototyping, um, because it doesn't allow you to do some of the functionality that I want you to be able to do from the microcontroller, um, such as interrupts, okay? All right, you are welcome to go into the Fermata code and copy and paste, all right, if you want to, or look at an example from there. You are not guaranteed that those examples are going to be something that I'm going to look at and be like, oh, this is really great code, okay? And I'm a pretty easy grader, right? Really? <laughs> I'm not an easy grader, but that's fine, okay? So, when you want to install the library, you're going to download it from Red Bear's GitHub. Do not download from anywhere else except their beta version GitHub, okay? There's a lot of stuff that's deprecated, all right? So go to their GitHub and download it, or get it from the Blackboard, because I'll post it. All right, so there's the, there it is. Just click on that. Um, it's a beta SDK. It works just fine with iOS 7. It works great, okay? So don't worry about that. Um, essentially, what you're going to do is you will download this um, libraries function up here in the GitHub, and you'll place that folder into the Arduino library, which is under, uh, if you're on a Mac, it's under, or Linux, it's under documents, Arduino, right, this is the home folder, right? Documents, Arduino, and then libraries, okay? And set it in there. And then restart the Arduino sketch program, okay? If you're writing the sketch from Windows, I think it's under documents or my documents or wherever they do it, um, Arduino libraries, unless you set it up differently, and I don't, I don't care. Okay? Good? Okay, so that will allow you to use this BLE events. Um, there are plenty of examples. You can even look up the Fermata. If you go in here to sketchbook, libraries, you can go under here to the 
um, Red Bear Library underscore Bluetooth Low Energy Shield. And there's all of these little things. You've got a little controller sketch, the Fermata sketch, a chat, simple control sketch. And they all have got little readmes on them, right? And they're not very good. Okay, that's why I'm going to go over them. Okay, so I'm wondering, should I do that? Yes. Yes, let's do it. Okay. I like your style. I'm going to do this. Okay, so we will set up one of their applications really, really quickly. Okay, watch. I just took the power out of the Arduino. Now I'm putting this in. What would happen if you didn't take the power out? Probably nothing. Maybe I would burn it. <laughs> ah. If you take these out and back in enough times, it's tough to get them back in. Haha, -ha. success. Connected. Wonderful. Okay. I'm putting the power back in. I am sorry that I'm treating you like this. I've seen it happen too many times. All right? I've seen it happen too many times. You get It's fine now. Everyone's like, I will never make that mistake. Until 9 o'clock at night when you're sitting in lab. And you just do it. All right? That's why I'm making a big deal out of it. Okay. So, now. It's plugged in. It's good to go. Um, let's go over here. Arduino. Uh, let me get rid of these. Do we want to save that? No, I don't want to save it. Okay. Here is, you know what? I can even just close that. What? That's fine. So essentially what I did here is I went to file. I can go to either sketchbook or I can go to examples. And bam, there's this little thing. I can I can pull up any of the things that I want here. I'm gonna I pulled up the chat app. Okay? So essentially. It's got the same code that I showed before, right? Got ble.begin, so underscore begin. If available, read the bytes. Sorry. While the Bluetooth energy is available, read them and then write them out to the serial port. And then while serial is available from my serial port, which is my USB, I'm going to take them, package them up, and then write them out to the Bluetooth. Okay? All right. So I will run this. Let's upload it. Uploading, uploading, <sighs> rainbow wheel. All right, done uploading. Okay. All right, serial port. I've set this up to 57.6. If I do not have that set up to 57.6, it's not going to read correctly. All right? It's my baud rate. It's set here as 57.6. Okay, advertising started, but we don't know what the hell that means, but we will. Okay, so moving on. Um, essentially, they've also written this wonderful little Xcode app. Hey, Bluetooth Low Energy Chat. We haven't talked about this. We'll talk about it. Don't worry. Class projector. Voila. Okay. So, oh, probably want to run it on my phone. Build succeeded. Okay. So, this is the wonderful little app that they wrote. Okay, pretty cool. I'm going to go over here to the serial monitor. What should I type? Hello, world. Enter. Nothing happened. You guys know me too well. All right, so I just hit the connect button. It's connecting. It's still connecting. Is it connecting? Do I have a breakpoint set? Probably. Great question. <laughs> 
Seriously? Ah, let's just restart. Hold on. Oh, well, well, yeah, upload it again. Fine, sure. Okay, so. Build succeeded. Connect. Hey, it connected. Okay. So now I'm going to type hello world. Hello world. Enter. Yeah, something happened. Hello world. Oh my goodness. You guys are not impressed <laughs> with this. How many Hello Worlds have you seen? All right, I just clicked inside the text box. I'm going to say hello, I-O-S. Send. Boom. No, if you guys turn in this app to me, you will fail. All right? This is the worst app I've ever seen. No, it's not true. This is not a great app. Okay? All right? But it at least shows a lot of the stuff behind the scenes with Bluetooth. Okay? Okay? Wonderful. Turn that off. Okay? Now, let's talk about all of this stuff that happened right here. Let's see what in earth is going on. There it goes. I gotta get a better app. Let's just write my own. Okay, so a Bluetooth primer. Um, how many of you guys have used Bluetooth before? One, two, three. So not four. Okay, <laughs> moving on. All right, so traditional Bluetooth. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just kidding, by the way. Um, all right, traditional Bluetooth. The way that traditional Bluetooth works, um, it was essentially, you guys are actually probably old enough to know when Bluetooth was first actually created. All right, it's for short range wireless, okay? It didn't exist when you were born, okay? But it does exist now. Wonderful, this is great. Um, it's got low to medium latency, all right? What do I mean by that? The round trip connection is pretty decent. It's probably around 100 milliseconds, right? Or lower, okay, for traditional Bluetooth. Okay, that's pretty fast. Okay, that's usually better than Wi-Fi. Okay, usually quite a bit better than Wi-Fi, depending on the network that you're on. Maybe not SMU's network, but usually. Okay. Um, and you can send a lot of you can send a lot of streaming data over Bluetooth. Okay, it's good for data like voice and audio. Okay, right. That's why you your your Bluetooth headset, right? You've got it. That is traditional Bluetooth. It's a little power hungry, okay? Um, it's because it's connection oriented. That means when you set up a connection in Bluetooth, that connection is maintained between the, your device and whatever your, you know, your, your two devices that you're pairing together. That connection is maintained even when there's no data flowing between them. Those wireless channels, they're up, they're running, they're ready to go, right? It is built to be low latency and take a lot of data all at one time, just like streaming onto it, okay? That is what traditional Bluetooth is built for. Right, and that is why you have a lot of Bluetooth like speakers and audio and you know the Bluetooth headsets, right? Because they could filter a lot of data really, really quickly. And when Bluetooth first came out, um, they said, you know what? We're going to support seven concurrent Bluetooth connections at one time. And people went, what? Why on earth would I want to connect seven different devices wirelessly? That's ridiculous. You need to just support maybe two at a time, right? They're like, why are you guys supporting seven? Okay? Right. Because we can. Right? Nowadays, <laughs> that eventually turned into, you guys, I can only do seven connections. It's like, but I need more than that. Okay? And I don't need it to be power hungry. Oh, and I can send one million symbols per second over traditional Bluetooth. Right? But traditional Bluetooth cannot run from a coin cell battery, no matter what you do. And it's limited to those seven concurrent connections. All right? 
So that is why we have a new protocol that is called Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE. Okay? This is different than traditional Bluetooth in some very important ways. First one, it is designed for the Internet of Things. Okay? It is designed for lots and lots of things to be on wireless transmission channels and to be running on coin cell batteries, to be running with not streaming data. So sometimes they just wake up and they want to send a little bit of data. Okay? It is optimized for those kind of conditions. Right? And thousands, thousands of things that you might want to connect to. Okay? Um, the way that it works, it's an asynchronous client-server model, right? So whenever you pair things together, one is going to be a client, one is going to be the server. It is low latency. And when I say low latency, three milliseconds max, start to finish. Okay? Round trip. That is from wake up to power down. All right? It is optimized for short bursts of information. Okay, it is not optimized for anything else. That is why you'll see things that if someone is trying to transmit audio over the Bluetooth low energy channel, it will work. It'll work. It's more power hungry than running traditional Bluetooth, right? But you can stream a million samples per second across Bluetooth low energy, but it's not optimized for that. It's going to kill the battery really, really quickly. Okay? Happiness? Good. The number of connections is greater than 2 billion. So they went from seven connections, more than two billion connections. All right? That is the theoretical limit. You are not going to get probably more than 20. <laughs> All right? Essentially, what this means is that the protocol, they changed the protocol so that there's no limit on the amount of things that you can have concurrently connected. There are still, like, there's hardware, there's battery issues, there's wireless transmission traffic that are still issues. Okay, but the bottleneck are those issues. They're no longer the protocol. Okay? Okay. So, um, the data that can be transferred, it can be triggered by if very event-driven, right? You don't have to have a connection and maintain it, right? You can be running a Bluetooth low-energy connection, and then you only want to actually, like, make a solid wireless connection when you have some data. So you have some event happens in the Arduino. You're like, sweet, I'm going to send some data now. It's optimized for that kind of communication. This asynchronous event triggered. Um, you can do a read at any time by a client. Um, it uses uh, the, inter the interface protocol. It uses the generic attribute protocol, or GAT. Yes? Good? Nothing? Sorry. Thought it was. Um, so it uses the client-server model. So inside of this model, there's a couple of things that we need to define. And the first thing is when we're talking about the GAT, Protocol is that uh, there's something called a characteristic. A characteristic is just data. Okay? It's just some piece of data that gets sent over the protocol. Um, a service is a collection of characteristics, a collection of these data that do something. Okay? And that is literally that is literally the definition. Okay? It's a collection of things. So there are some services that are built into the GAP protocol, like asking for model name or asking for the serial number, right? Those are things that are implemented. Everything else is kind of user defined, right? So if you wanted to set up a service which was, hey, you know, I've got an Arduino here. It is running a temperature sensor. So I'm going to create a service which is temperature request, right? You can transmit temperature data over a temperature request protocol. But you completely define what that is, okay? It's just a, a generic service that you can do. Is this okay? Um, there's also these things called descriptors, where um, I can send out a descriptor. So, like, I can advertise for, hey, what services do you provide? And you're like, oh, I've, you know, I've got temperature, this, da da da, -da. Um, And it's like, oh, yeah, temperature. And then I can say, okay, give me a descriptor of some of those temperature attributes, and it'll give you more descriptions about it. So, for instance, I can provide that in Celsius or Fahrenheit. Okay? That would be a descriptor of the service that it provides. Happiness? Okay. So uh, as part of the GAP protocol, everything has a universally unique identification, right? A UUID. That is 128 bits. Okay? Um, so it's very, very unlikely that my... Anyway. Um, it's very, very unlikely that uh, you'll get collisions in that UUID naming convention right now. Okay? Ten years, I don't know that that's true. Okay? 
Um, but the operations that you can um, provide as part of the GAT protocol will be, oh, I'm going to go discover all of the things that are broadcasting their UUID. Okay, so I can, I can send a transmit and say, hey, I'm going to discover these, and people will transmit back their UUIDs. Okay? Man, the video is like messing me up here. What's going on? I can't have you guys not see me. That would just be, be awful. Oh, come on. I'm going to give this 30 seconds. If it doesn't work in 30 seconds, we're just going to give up on it. You're not going to have any video. I know. I know. Right? Craziness. I can do this. I wonder if the Bluetooth is interfering with my Wi-Fi connection here, this little local thing. They're both on 2.4 gigahertz. Well, we're not going to get it. Okay. No more video. It's okay. No video. Um, so after you can discover those UUIDs, you can go through them and you can say, okay, what services do each of you provide, right? So there's a protocol set up for you can uh, find out those services, right? Or secondary services that they can do as well, right? They're classified differently. You can also discover the characteristics for a service, right? So what data you provide as part of a service, right? Find characteristics for a given UUID, right? These are all things that are built into the GAP protocol and get descriptors for that characteristic, okay? There's a set way of doing a lot of these. Um, the way that this works, does anybody know how wireless transmission works? Um, it's kind of a big question. <laughs> it's kind of a big question. Perfect. Yes, that's a great answer, honestly. Does anybody know? Okay, so when you're transmitting something, you can have a bunch of different bands that you transmit on, right? It's essentially, you take 2.4 gigahertz, you break it up, and it's like, okay, here's a bunch of different bands that there are. There are 40 different bands for Bluetooth low energy, okay, that you can transmit on simultaneously without interfering with each other. Three of those bands are for advertising. Okay? So that means you are advertising yourself on those three bands. Okay? The other 37 bands are for transmitting data. So essentially someone might be listening to you advertising on those three different bands. It's like, oh hey, cool, I want to connect to you. Let's connect over on, you know, data transmission number 33. Okay? And we'll connect to each other and we'll transmit some data and it'll be all fun. It'll be great. Okay? You guys don't like my metaphors. You do. Thank you, Cameron. All right. So essentially the way that this works is that you have two different things that are trying to pair inside of a standby mode. Okay? So one of the devices is scanning. Okay? It's going out. It's just listening for people that are on the airwaves. One of the devices is advertising on the airwaves. Okay? This is simple now, but I want there's some definitions that I want you guys to be clear about as we go through this. Your master, the master, is the one that is going through and scanning, okay? The slave are any of the other things that are advertising what they do on those channels, okay? So once the master selects one of the slaves that it wants to connect to, it initiates the connection, okay? That connection cannot be initiated by the slave. Then it says, okay, I'm going to initiate the connection. Everybody agrees to connect. They connect to each other. They transmit some data. And then if that connection ever gets broken, they go back to the standby modes. Okay? And then they keep going back for scanning and advertising. Okay? So this right here, that is the property of the master. This right here, that is the property of the slave. Okay? Why is this important? Have you guys ever heard of iBeacons? An iBeacon. It's new with iOS 7. Although Android's been doing it for a little while. Okay? Um, it's essentially um, during the Super Bowl. Okay? Um, they wired up the entire field um, with all of these kind of Bluetooth little hotspot places. Okay? And these were iBeacons. They were beaconing what they were. Okay? And essentially, if you had an app, right, your app is the master iPhone is the master. You're going around and you're walking around um, the, the field 
and essentially you get in range of one of these Bluetooth low energy connections and it's advertising something like, hey, you know, half price hot dogs, right? Or half price beer, okay? And that would, if you are looking for those kind of things on your phone, be like, oh, hey, look, you know, you can do the same thing with like Foursquare, right? It's beaconing out. You're just like, oh, I'm going to select that, and you find out where you are. And it's these localized advertising things that happen, right? This is supposed to be the wave of the future. I don't know if it's going to happen. We'll see, okay? But one of the things that's very, very important about this is that your phone is the one who initiates the contact, okay? You can have as many eye beacons out there as, as you want, but if you are not actively wanting to connect to one, you don't connect to them. They cannot initiate the connection. You can't get a pop-up on your phone from slaves, okay? Okay, so who's who? The iPhone is the master. This is the slave, as I just went over, okay? So initiate the connection, advertise the connection. You will also um, hear this sometimes called where this is the central, this is the peripheral, okay? Server, client, all right? Good, okay, so inside of iOS, we're gonna use the Red Bear API for connecting two things. It's very, very simple. If you wanted to, we could write our own code, but we'll go ahead and use it there. It's only a few lines. Um, Essentially what this is going to do, it's going to allow us to instantiate a Bluetooth low energy object. It's a class. Um, it's going to allow us to connect to different advertisers, okay, where the phone is always the master. Okay, and that's by design. Um, we're going to use delegation for responding to incoming data. What do I mean by that? We're going to set ourselves as the delegate. We're going to adopt a protocol. Delegation. Yeah? No? Yes. Good. Okay. We're good. Um, we will add this as a framework to any of our projects, and that's it. And you can download all of this from their GitHub page, um, which I had up last time. I guess I didn't have it up this time. Um, but you can, that same GitHub page that I had up earlier. And I put a link to it on the website, too. The, the, BLE shield. Okay? Okay, so this is the protocol. This is what I mean by delegation. They define a protocol, we adopt that protocol, and we set ourselves as the delegate, just like we were a UI table view scroll delegate. All right? So we're going to set ourselves up as a, a Bluetooth low energy delegate, and that means that we get access to these four optional um, methods, right? So BLE did connect. What happens there? Boom, we made a connection, and here's the notification. So once that, once that connection is made, this function gets called. Okay, and you can do whatever you want inside that function. Disconnect, same thing. BLE did update RSSI. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah, it's our received signal strength indicator. Okay, so RSSI is essentially every time that you get a connection, part of the header of the, like all of the data that's in there, part of the header is telling you <coughs> Um, something that you can use to get the signal strength that your Bluetooth low energy is at, okay? And so you can always, you know, whenever that RSSI gets updated, you can say, hey, my signal strength is, and this is going to be in dB, okay? So if you have an RSSI of negative, I don't know, 20, that's a really strong signal, okay? And an RSSI of negative 180, I'm surprised you even got us, were able to read the RSSI, Okay? And then here's the really fun one. Bluetooth Low Energy did receive data. Data. Length. Awesome. So those are the bytes that came in. Okay? Um, we also have access to inside of this, this class is um, a mutable array of peripherals, all of the different peripherals that we're connected to um, or that we could connect to. Um, and then we're going to have this thing called an active peripheral, which this is whatever we're actively connected to right at this second. Okay, so we're connected to some 2 billion devices. Here's the active one that we want to transmit messages to. Okay. And then there's also some other functions in there. I'll let you read their public API. This is straight off of their .h file, which is their public API. 
Okay, so you can look up these, um, and I'm going to show you how to go through each of these. Okay, so peripheral initiation. We're going to set up a view controller. I'm going to inherit from UI view controller and set myself up as a Bluetooth low energy delegate, right? So I'm adopting the BLE delegate protocol. And here is my class called BLE, Bluetooth low energy. And I'm just going to name that BLE shield. Okay, it's pointer to BLE of class. Good, happiness? All right, moving on. Um, whenever we want to start the search for all of the different peripherals that are advertising around us, we can use this call right here. Um, let's see, do I have a... Hmm. Okay. So... My BLE shield, I'm going to call this, this function on the instance. It's find BLE peripherals with a timeout of three seconds. All right, so go through, get all of the peripherals that you can as long as they don't time out before three seconds. Okay, if they time out, just forget about that peripheral. Okay, it's part of the advertising that's there. Um, then the way that they uh, actually connect to those are they set up a timer that's scheduled for three seconds and at the end of three seconds, it's going to call this function called connection timer. Okay? So this is an asynchronous call here, this find BLE peripheral. So I, I'm going to call it, a few clock ticks are going to go by, and then it's going to immediately return while it's searching for peripherals for three seconds. Okay? I set off a timer for three seconds. Once that is done, I'm going to go through here, say if BLE shield.peripherals.count is greater than zero, what would that mean? if I have any connections, any peripherals at all that exist. I'm going to go through here. I'm going to say, hey, connect the peripheral, BLE shield dot peripherals object at index zero. What does that do? It takes the first one it found and connects it. Why would you want to do that? If they responded first, you want to connect it. Why would you want to do that? If I, okay, so here we are. You know what? We'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. You guys think I'm going to mull it over a little bit? Why would you want to connect to the first thing? Huh? Maybe not. It gives the strongest signal? Uh, maybe. It's just whoever responded first. We'll come back to it. Um, so after this, I call this, you know, I want to connect the peripheral. Once I connect to that peripheral, then, bam, I get my little delegation function right here, and I can do whatever I want, right? Here, they set up a timer, okay? You can do whatever you want in did connect. Is this the proper way to connect? No. Why would you ever want to connect to the first thing that came across, that you came across? I cannot think of a reason, okay? Ah, if you wanted to set up a tutorial for people and you wanted to make it really, really easy for them to hit the connect button on their iPhone and have it just connect to the first Bluetooth low energy peripheral that was there, that's what you would want to do. And that's what Red Bear did. Okay? But let's say everybody's, they're working, it's Wednesday, it's lab time, we've got all of our Bluetooth shields, they're all hooked up, they're all running, and all of a sudden you hit connect and you connect to the first one. I don't know if it's yours. It might be, you know, this other team's over here, and they're like, whoa, it's going crazy, right? If they're advertising themselves as a, as a peripheral, which you can set up to do, but, it, and, I mean, initially, the iPhone isn't advertising itself, okay? Not as a peripheral. You can set it up to do that, right? I, will hope, to, I hope to talk about iBeacons. Um, but I'm probably going to do it as a bonus lecture because that firmware is not set up yet. Apple hasn't released the source code for what they want that firmware to look like on the Arduino yet, right? So we might be able, we can set it up between two phones, no problem. But what the Arduino has to do to actually be a real, true, 100% iBeacon uh, is still proprietary. Okay. So if they release it, I'll do a lecture on it at the end. Okay. All right. So, if we want to do some reading, how are we doing? Oh, six minutes. Good. Okay. I get access to this. This Bluetooth Low Energy did receive data, data and the length of it. Um, this happens. This is the data that it received on the line right here. So, essentially, I've got this thing called NSData D equals data with bytes of length, right? So, it goes in here, it takes that dynamic memory, and it returns it back as NSData. 
Then I'm going to take that data that's stored in D and I'm going to allocate an NS string with this type of encoding. Okay, it's essentially a care array. All right, and then I'm going to set some label equal to S. So what does that do? Every time I get some data, I'm going to take it, I'm going to cast it back as an NS string, and I'm just going to spit it out on a text label, right? So if I were to type in hello world onto my computer, like I just did a little while ago, this would display it up there inside of that text label. That's exactly what this does. This is taken exactly from there. This is not going to cut it for A5, is it? No, it's really not. Why? Yes, it is, because it's boring, right? Yeah, you've got a bunch of different things that are you want to send back, right? And they might be event triggered, right? You need to send data of different types. How are you going to do that? How would you send data of different types? Huh? Have a protocol. Define your own protocol, right? And for Bluetooth Low Energy... That is standard operating procedure. You define your own protocol. Okay? So, okay, when my first byte is, I don't know, 0A, that means that the data I'm about to send is of one type. If it's 0B, something else. Okay? That, that first byte could be your opcode. You can do whatever you want. Just make sure it's consistent and in fairly good design. You got it. Just make sure it's consistent. Okay. Writing data. If you want to write data, let's say I was, you know, typing into that little um, text box, right? And then I hit send. This is how they did it. They said, okay, if self.textField.length is greater than 16, I'm just going to chop off everything above 16. Okay. Then I'm going to say, okay, so this is a string with format here. Where I've got this slash r slash n. What is that? Carriage return line feed, right? So carriage return, new line. That was their protocol that they set up. They said every string that comes in will end with carriage return and a new line. Okay. The reason they did that is because if you're spitting it back out on the serial port, it doesn't matter what encoding you're using, whether you're on Windows or Mac or whatever, it'll do go to the next line. Okay? Fair enough? All right. So essentially it creates a string. And then it says data using encoding. It uses this encoding and it returns it as a byte array. Okay, D right here. It's an NS data. That's a byte array. And then BLE shield write D. It will write that out to the shield. Okay? Good? You can define your own protocol for if you wanted to send control signals to the Arduino. You can do the same type of thing here. Except you won't be using NS strings here. You'll have some control signal you want to send that the Arduino knows what that bytes are going to look like, and it does something different. Is that okay? Right? Maybe it's, maybe it's three bytes that you're sending that tell it to do something, or change its mode, or increment something. Whatever you want to do. Very open-ended. For next time, we're going to do a Python crash course. Questions? The, yes, it'll be a little weird. You'll have to use the ready, the ready in bit on it, which essentially um, you can set that up to be any pin that you want, right? So you can set it up on one of the interrupt pins, um, and then you can generate an interrupt from that. The only problem is you want to make sure that any of the spy communication that happens occurs, and then do whatever you want to do based on that interrupt that occurred. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, I mean, it there's no real great way to do it because you don't really want to trigger an interrupt that way. You would just want to send a control command, right? In instead of triggering an interrupt. I think, I think it, it makes more sense from a design perspective to just have it be an opcode that you go through. Okay. So we will talk about PyMongo. Hey, has anybody used Tornado before? Facebook's open source thing? No? Now yeah, we'll use it. Um, NumPy? 
Numpy. Somebody's used Numpy. NumPy. Okay. Next time we'll do that. Uh, what was Python named after? Somebody tell me. Monty Python. Monty Python. Ba bam. All right. Moving on. How much time did I have left? Zero minutes. Woo. I'll see you guys next time.